Hello and welcome to the Extended Greg YouTube channel. I'm Greg and on today's show we're going to be building a live streaming audio and a live streaming encoder for a webcam. It's going to be a lot of fun and it's going to uh, certainly leverage a lot of the hardware encoding capabilities of the Raspberry Pi and give us a lot of flexibility in terms of what we could do with it in the future. So this is just dipping our toe in using FFmpeg, so let's get right into it. All right, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to actually just configure it. So pretty much what we're using today is we're using a Raspberry Pi 4 and it's going to have a USB webcam. In this case, I'm using a pretty terrible one, but it's just gotta be UVC uh, capable, which that's pretty much the driver that we're using for it. We're gonna use uh, V4L2, which is video for Linux 2. But pretty much what that will allow us to do is pretty much use any off the shelf webcam to be able to do this, including a lot of actual input cards and things like that but this is strictly focusing on USB interfaces and things like that. Uh, at some other point, we'll do CSI interfaces uh, for cameras and also for uh, HDMI inputs. But for today, we're just gonna keep it simple, which I say is a relative term. We're also going to be using an SD card with Alpine Linux installed, and this builds upon our previous uh, tutorial videos and uh, live streams relating to Alpine Linux. Uh, so we'll go through the basics here just so it's self-contained, but be feel free to check out any of those. I'll put a link somewhere in here and probably in the description as well. Uh, but we're going to set that up really quick just with a base configuration, give it a nice name, set up networking, things like that. So we can install the packages that we need and then copy over the scripts that I've already pre-written uh, to actually be able to make it work. And as a receiver, just so we can actually see it, since we are generating a network stream, uh, we do want to actually see the output. And we're just gonna be using the Pi 400, uh, which we actually built in a previous stream, two streams ago, as it were, uh, when we made the network video encoder and display. We're using the display portion of that exactly as built with no modifications to view the video that we're going to be creating with this encoder. So. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So let's go ahead and get started. So first we're going to do set up Alpine. Set our keyboard. I'm going to give it a name. So it's going to be webcam encoder. Set up our network. We're going to do ethernet zero with DHCP. No Wi-Fi for this. We'll get an IP address really quick. And we'll set an extremely secure password. <laughs> there we go. And we'll set the time zone. So in my case, I'm on the East Coast of the US, so I'm gonna do US Eastern. No proxy server. We're going to use Crony for NTP. Hopefully it actually syncs. Otherwise I got to do a quick modification just because of some network restrictions on my end. Wait for it. Okay, so it didn't sync. But so what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip this part for now and revisit it in a second after I correct the addresses in the file. But what I was trying to do was set up the repositories for APK, which is the packet manager for Alpine Linux. And pretty much it wasn't able to find it. We're not gonna set up a uh, separate user for this. We're just gonna use the root login because we're gonna make it so it can run completely headless. So there's actually no reason to log into it at all. And now granted, if this was a production setup, things like that, or if it was going to be available to the internet, I would highly recommend setting up a user and actually running it through that, but that's a little bit outside the scope of this particular tutorial. So next we'll set up SSH and we're actually going to be using SSH to do the configuration so I can copy in the files a little more efficiently, but technically there's no reason why you couldn't do this just straight from the terminal. And because we only set up a root login and no other users, we're going to actually type yes so we can log in through SSH. But again, this is not a production setting. This is just because we're messing around. I'm not going to install an SSH key, although that would make it a bit more secure. 
Uh, we're not going to install it to the disk. We're going to use the memory card for our configs, and we're going to use it for our APK cache. And just if you're not familiar with Alpine Linux, it is an embedded operating system, so every time it boots, it actually loads everything it needs to be able to run into RAM and doesn't use the SD card. So any changes that aren't explicitly saved are discarded on every reboot. So it's, it makes it very secure, but it also makes it so for applications like this, it's very consistent. So once it is working, generally it will stay working. So we've completed our setup. So let me actually correct the repos for APK because we are going to need that. So I'm just going to VI into etc crony crony.conf and I'm just going to change a few addresses here. Assuming I can type. Save that out. We'll restart Crony. And now it should actually be able to synchronize the time. We'll verify that in a second when we actually uh, get back to a prompt. And we do, it shows 106.55. So that is the current time. So now we can do setup APK repos. And that pretty much just pulls up the same thing that we skipped, just that one element. We could do setup Alpine again, but we'd have to go through all of the other configuration setups. So that's just a little annoying. So we'll just do the one that we skipped. And now that's done. And we can test it by doing APK update. And we see we have 5,159 packages. So now we want to actually enable the community repository in order to get about 15,000 more. So we're going to do VI forward slash etc forward slash apk repositories and we're just going to remove the comment from the community line right here we will save that out we'll do apk update again and we'll see we have 19,333 there it is packages available and that includes ffmpeg and also uh, the v4l uh, utilities which we'll need for this so Pretty much that's our base configuration. I'm gonna save it out, so I'm gonna do LBU, commit, dash D, and that will make it so it persists on the next reboot. In case we mess anything up, we can always just reboot and pretty much get back to this point right here. So let's start our actual configuration of the encoder itself. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna set up, we're gonna do setup, dash D E V D. And this is, uh, it's included with Alpine, and pretty much what it's going to do is just set up our input devices. And instead of doing mdev, which is the default, we're gonna do udev. And then scan hardware and populate dev, and we wanna do y for yes. And it's gonna do its thing, and it's done. Very straightforward. Next, we want to actually go and add our packages that we need. So we're going to do apk add, and we're going to do ffmpeg, which is actually going to do the encoding and actually initiate, send out the transport stream for the video. We're going to do v4l utils. We're going to do alsa utils, which is for audio. And we're going to do screen. And the reason we're doing screen is uh, that's actually going, the init is going to call that uh, when it boots. So in the event that we actually need to log in and see what the current status of FFmpeg is, we can actually see that. So, but that's actually really the only four packages that we need. And then it needs a hundred other dependencies, which it's installing now. But the total space is only 88 megabytes on the disk after everything is installed. So, now we can get on to actually putting in the custom scripts. So before we do that, let's do lbu commit d, just so we have all of our progress saved to this point. And let's actually start by just modifying the user config file. And ordinarily, you can actually just put this in a regular computer in an SD card reader and be able to actually just 
edit it right there directly. But since we're logged into here locally on the console, let's actually do it through here. So we're going to do mount forward slash media forward slash MMC BLK zero P one. So multimedia card block device zero partition one. And then we're going to do dash O RW comma remount. And this is going to take our root hard drive, our actual boot drive, and instead of it being mounted as read only the way it is now, we're going to make it read write accessible so we can make modifications to it. We do that, no errors, excellent. So now we can go in and we can edit user config. And by default, when you actually copy over the files from a zip file to a FAT32 formatted drive, SD card, I should say, it won't have a user config.txt file included. But we're going to modify one that I've already created just because it makes it a little bit easier so we don't have to reboot. So we're going to do vi forward slash media forward slash mmc blk 0 p1 user cfg.txt. And I'm just going to delete those top two lines since I was just testing with those. But the critical things are the DT overlay, which in this case is vc4-fkms-v3d. Camera auto detect one, which actually is uh, not required in this circumstance. I was trying to do it with CSI today, but it was having problems with uh, trying to get that to actually detect correctly. And so we're not doing that. So DT overlay arm boost, which is the power modification for Raspberry Pi four in particular. Uh, so it has an additional regulator that it's able to use in order to get more power to the CPU to be able to have higher performance. It's a good practice to actually include that for Alpine Linux. Otherwise, it will default to the same power settings that a Raspberry Pi 3 has. And at that point, or 3, 2, and 1. And at that point, you're just going to be leaving performance on the table. So we'll make sure to include that. And just to keep everything visible here, I'm actually explicitly defining uh, to disable overscan, which is the black border around the outside. Uh, hot plug, so I can switch between this and the display that we're going to use for the output. And then just defining that it should be 1080, uh, 1080p, excuse me, output uh, just for the video resolution. So, but you don't actually have to include those if you don't want to. The top two lines are really the ones that you need. So we'll write that out. And now we'll mount our SD card back as read-only, just for everybody's sake. So we'll do mount, forward slash media, forward slash MMC BLK 0 P1, dash O, R O, comma, remount. Spelling it right is key. There it is. So right now it's back to read-only. We have it, so the next time we reboot, those changes will take effect. Uh, in this particular case, the changes were already present the last time I rebooted, so we shouldn't necessarily have to do that, but we'll do it anyway at certain points just to confirm that it is in fact doing what we think it's doing. So next we need to make a configuration directory. So we're going to do make dir, and we're going to do forward slash etc, and we're going to do ffmpeg dash run as the name of the directory because the executable that we're going to create is called ffmpeg-run so we'll create a folder of the same name just to keep everything kind of coherent and associated and no errors come up so now that's created so next let's actually create our config file so we'll do vi forward slash etc forward slash ffmpeg-run and we're just gonna call it config with no extension. I used to, I use VI just because it copies in a lot easier and more cleanly than Nano. Nano can actually have issues with uh, line terminations and things like that if you're copying, especially from Windows over to um, Linux. So VI in particular, you know, is a lot cleaner. And actually I say that 
I'm actually still on the local console, so that's going to be a bit tedious to have to retype that. So let me actually move over to a putty session here really quick. So we'll switch here. Move this keyboard out of the way. All right, and we're logged in. So we'll just do that same command. So vi forward slash etc forward slash ffmpeg run config. And this is going to be our config file. And I'm just going to copy this over. And I'll just go through it really quick just so we can kind of see what everything is. So up here we have, and this is pretty much just a shell script that we're gonna include in sor as source in our file that will actually launch FFmpeg. And it'll just make it so everything is kind of self-contained. And then also if we wanted to update the script in the future, uh, we will be able to do it without blowing away our entire configuration and having to redo it. I think it'll make it a lot easier in terms of uh, if anybody actually wants to use this. I am going to be posting this to Git with a write-up with instructions on how to do this, as well as links to this video. Uh, so be sure to check back. It'll be in, the link will actually be in the description. So first here we have the video input and it's forward slash dev forward slash video zero. And the way I found that out was by doing V4 L, that is an L, not a number one, two, dash ctl and then doing dash 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 list devices so if we actually save this out and we type that in so we do v4 l2 dash ctl dash dash list devices we see that it gives us a number of options so some of them are for the hardware encoders and decoders which we will actually be using as part of this, which you see our video like 10 through 31, 13, etc. Those are the hardware encoders and decoders and RPIVID, things like that. So we can't actually use that to be able to as our camera because those are just internal loopbacks for the actual hardware itself on the CPU. But we do see at the very bottom that there is this life cam here. And this is actually really old it's one that I had, uh, I had two cameras that I had as options. Uh, it only does 720p, but I think it's gonna be more than enough to be indicative of what this process actually is. And we see here that it has video zero, video one, and media four. So generally speaking, the top one is going to be your video. The second one is going to be your metadata. So we just wanna use video zero as the actual configuration for our configuration file. And that's what we have set here. Next, we actually want to do, we want to find out what video format it should be. So we're going to run this command. And here where it says video input device, we're going to replace that with forward slash dev forward slash video zero. So let's go ahead and actually run that. Replacing that term with forward slash dev forward slash video zero. And it shows us two options, which is YUYV and motion JPEG, MJPG. And pretty much, I will say this, those are really the only two options on most cameras that are using this particular driver. But there's one key difference is that it actually needs to be spelled out MJP. JPEG. The other one, YUVIV, you know, is, is fine as it is, but for whatever reason, there's no parity in terms of those that particular terminology and the way that it's implemented. And specifically, uh, I'm implementing it through FFmpeg. And we'll go through that code when we copy it in a second. So just keep that in mind. But it is mjpeg and it is actually said in other places as well with the uh, ext option so we'll see that but we look at our video width video height and frames per second and a lot of cameras will have 
restrictions in terms of what their capabilities are because of hardware limitations. So if we do this and we do EXT for extended, we see here it actually gives us a lot of options. So it has the JPEG up here. At the very top, it has the YUYV, but at much lower resolutions and much lower frame rates. So the only way for us to get 30 frames per second would be to actually do a 640 by 480 stream, which is not necessarily something that anybody would enjoy watching. So for 1280 by 720, which is the maximum for this particular camera, we would only be able to do 10 frames per second, which would be very choppy. So we don't actually want to do that. We want to do motion JPEG, which is compressed. So it has a lot more ability to be able to fit higher resolution video through the USB connection. This is a USB 2.0 camera. So for us, 1280 by 720, we can do 30 frames per second using motion JPEG. So that's pretty much how we came to those numbers. So the resolution that we wanted, the frames per second that we wanted, and the codec that we wanted to use. So continuing down through the file, the next thing is the audio input. Because obviously you're gonna, you know, maybe you just want video alone and that's perfectly fine. But since this is a webcam, it has a built-in microphone, we wanna be able to use that too. So the way that we find that is using A record and the A stands for ALSA. That's part of the ALSA utilities package. And we do A record dash L. And when we do that, we see that it, it shows our camera and it shows the USB audio and it says sub device zero and it's pretty much sub device zero. So card zero sub device zero. So what that does is it gives it an address of zero zero. Pretty straightforward. So when we go back into our config file, I have defined it saying that we're gonna call it by its hardware location. So HW colon zero for the card comma zero for the input so for the sub device so that's how we came up with that next is the number of audio channels a lot of cameras will have two audio channels for stereo audio in this particular case this only has one for unknown reasons so i had to define one but i did put that note there you can find that out but Realistically, if it gives you an error, change it down to one. It will tell you pretty verbosely in FFmpeg. And then the next thing is our sample rate. And the sample rate is just how many samples per second it's going to run. And generally speaking, 44 or 44,100 is a good number for voice. 48,000 is good for music. But you can use either of them, really, and they'll both be able to do it. 44,100 is... CD quality audio. Down here is output format. And in this particular case, since I'm actually streaming and OBS is set to 23.976, I did the same frame rate here just to keep everything. So it's going to down convert the frame rate and that's going to let it actually keep up with the encoding. If you tried to do 30 frames per second, it might not actually have enough horsepower in the Raspberry Pi 4 to be able to do that encoding in real time. So because of that, you would get buffer underrun conditions or buffer overrun, excuse me, conditions where the video would be coming in faster than it could process it and the buffer would fill up and FFmpeg would crash. So we obviously don't want to do that. So lowering the frame rate is a good idea. And 23976 is the same as film. It's very effective. It's, you know, the motion is still fluid. So we're going to use that for today. And then for our bitrate, obviously higher is better, but we're just going to use 5 megabits per second or thereabouts, or defining it as 5,000 kilobits per second. For our audio bitrate, it's going to be encoded as an MP3. Uh, technically, AAC was another option, but it's going to use 128 kilobits per second, which is more than sufficient for voice or music. You know, this is, it's still a webcam. You know, something to keep that in mind. And for our output format, we're going to use MPEG TS, which is going to create a TS stream. And our output address is going to be the same address that we used 
for the last demo, which is our multicast address of 239.1.1.1 on port 10,000 using a UDP stream. And that will let us just receive it with the settings that we actually implemented previously. So that's our config file. So going on from there, we need to actually create our run file, our ffmpeg-run file. So we're going to do vi. I'm going to type in the right, in the right uh, window. vi forward slash bin forward slash ffmpeg-run. And pretty much what I'm going to do is just copy in what I've already created. And it's a pretty short script. So what this is, is it pretty much is going to, it's going to call our source file, it's, or it's going to use the source command, excuse me, to uh, call in our config. So that way it can actually configure it. And then down here, I have a while loop, which will run forever. And then inside of that is FFmpeg. So I'll just kind of go through exactly what the syntax is um, as an overview. But first thing we're going to do is just put in a flag and it's going to ignore DTS errors. So a lot of times with live input devices, you will have issues where it will say non-monotonous non or whatever it is, um, DTS. And DTS is a timestamp, digital timestamp. And pretty much it's just saying what the order of the frames are. So we want it to obviously be monotonical as it were. So we want to make sure that it's actually going to be in order. So we're just going to ignore that on the input. Then I've split these out. So this next line handles the video input. So RE means it's a real time input for a live input. Dash F is our format. So it's going to use the V4L2 uh, pretty much input format. Then Confusingly, it says input format, but that's actually the that's how it sets up the camera. And that's the video format, which is the motion JPEG that we defined in the config file. Our video size will be our width and our height for our video. And then dash I will be the video input, which is the forward slash dev forward slash video zero that we defined in the config file as well. Similarly to that, we have our audio on the next line. So it's a real-time input. We're going to use ALSA as our actual uh, input format. We're going to have the number of channels that we specify. In this case, it's going to be one channel. We have our sample rate, which in this case is going to be 44,100. And then we have our HW colon 0 comma 0 as our input device. Great, pretty straightforward, right? So it's just, it's taking our values from the actual config file. And just so you know, uh, normally inside of uh, shell files, you don't actually need to put the brackets, but I find that putting the brackets actually helps with making sure that you don't have too many letters added onto the end of the variable name when it's adjacent to it. And you'll see that in a few situations here. So. Our next thing down is our video filter. And what this is going to do, this is going to do our frame rate conversion. So it's going to down convert, uh, or not down convert, but it's going to change our frame rate to 23976 from 30. And it's also going to create our timestamps and it's going to ge regenerate them pretty much from scratch. So it's gonna be the number of frames over our frame rate over the total time pretty much. So it's, it's pretty much going to generate it automatically based on where it is and how long it's been streaming. Next, we're going to be using a specific codec, and this is actually included as part of the base uh, available package for Alpine Linux FFmpeg. And it's a newer version, like OMX was an older version of hardware encoding, but the M2M variant, as they say, so V4L2, M2M is the new hardware version, pretty much, of hardware encoding. 
and it's going to use the actual GPU in order to do the hardware encoding for H.264. So that's pretty much what that is. And then we set our bitrate, which again comes from the config file. We have our PIX format. This is a long line. Our PIX format has to be YUV420P. Uh, so we define that here because H.264 as the standard requires it. And then we have dash G, which in this case is going to do, and that stands for GOP size. So that's pretty much our keyframe interval for our stream. And pretty much that's a fully, a full frame opposed to it being a partial frame. So we're gonna have one of those every second. So at our frame rate. Next down here, we have our audio encoding settings. So we have our, we're gonna use MP3 encoding. Our bit rate is going to be as defined in our config file. Our audio rate is going to be our sample rate as defined in our config file. And then down here, we're going to use preset ultra fast and tune zero latency to try and get the fastest transport that we can. And then we're going to here define our output format and address from our config file. And it's going to loop over that pretty much in perpetuity if it has any issues and doesn't just freeze solid. So I will say that. So it doesn't always exit cleanly if there is something because it is doing a lot of processing with video and things like that. So there's going to be a lot of threads in play. So just something to keep in mind. You know, it's not it's not necessarily going to be as reliable as it could be with some additional lines, but I think it's simple enough to understand while still being able to serve the purpose. So just something to keep in mind. I wouldn't go to production with this right out of the bat, but that's our executable file. So we'll save that out. And now we actually just need to go through and save it. So it's ex make it so it's executable. So we're going to do chmod plus X forward slash bin forward slash ffmpeg run. And then because of course we want this to persist through reboots, we're gonna add this to LBU. So we're gonna do LBU add forward slash bin forward slash ffmpeg run. And then we can save that out. And the last thing that we need to do is we need to create our init file. So let's do vi forward slash etc forward slash init d forward slash ffmpeg. And again, I'm going to copy in pretty much the same thing that we had for uh, the past few videos in terms of creating services based on screen and something I wrote previous to that. But it works really well in terms of making sure that you have the ability to be able to console back in without it taking up your local console and taking over everything pretty much. So I'm just going to leave that as is. I've covered that in other videos, but it's going to run it in the background. So we'll save that out. And again, we need to make that executable. So we're going to do chmod plus x forward slash etc forward slash init d forward slash ffmpeg and add it to LBU. So LBU add forward slash ETC forward slash init D FFmpeg. And we will save that as well. So that's pretty much it. So we've now created all of the files that we need in order to be able to run this. So let's go through a few things to kind of make sure that everything's going to run the way we expect. And the first thing that we're going to do is we will actually do a test. So let's just run the file directly. So we'll do ffmpeg run. And we'll make sure that it's running. And when we go over to the output of our Pi, which may or may not be active at the moment, I may need to kick it. Let's see. There we go. There we go. 
All right, so now we have the right, webcam, so which is much less camera. flattering than my it's regular cameras. It's, my regular it's overexposed. Cameras. It's overexposed. You can see the green screen. You can see the green screen. You can hear me in the background. You can hear me in the background. So let's let's do a so sync test. I'm gonna clap once. Test. I'm gonna clap once. And this will also show us our latency. This will also show us our latency. So it's about two and a half to three about seconds. Two and a half to three seconds. So let me actually mute my so mic let and let's listen to it. And let's listen to it. Check one two. Check one two. Check one two three. One two three. Check one two three. One two three. Oh, I'm you're gonna hear the speaker. So this is me actually trying out the webcam itself. So you can see me talking in the bottom corner. I don't have a full screen of this unfortunately, but you can see me actually talking. Hopefully it's in sync. I think it is, but it is definitely something where it's quite usable. If you had a better camera, I think it would have a lot better image quality. So we'll bring this back down. And I'll turn back on my mic. And I'll turn back on my mic. And when we go back over to Putty, we do see that it is chugging away. So it's doing 24 frames per second. The speed is currently 0.999 X. And pretty much what that's going to do is just hang around there and just keep chugging away. It may never reach one because if it's at one, it may actually be a little bit more than real time for some reason. So it's definitely tough to say, but we see that it's bit rate is about 4 1,200, so it's not going to use all of the available bandwidth if it doesn't need it, excuse me. Yeah, it's not going to use all of the available bandwidth if it doesn't need it, but I do want to point out some nice things here. So we see it's actually using the hardware encoding. So we see it's using the BCM 2835 codec on the card for the encoder. And it's going to use the formats that we asked. It's outputting the multicast stream just as we wanted it to. We just saw that. So we see it is working. So let's go ahead and finish up getting everything set with our init file. Click into here to actually exit. So I'm just going to do control C to exit. So we're happy with how that actually turned out. So let's add it as a startup service and then run it. So we're going to do RC update, add FFmpeg default, spelling it right once again. And we see that it's added it as the default run level. So we'll save that out. Actually, let's run it first. So we'll do forward slash etc forward slash init D forward slash FFmpeg start. And we see it started successfully. So we had all of the necessary dependencies as well as making it so it's running as we expect. And if we go back over to the output of the computer, we should actually see it come up. I see the camera is on. I'm just going to restart the uh, OMX player. This is multicast, so there's actually nothing going back to the encoder to say whether it's working or not. So I do have to check it here on the player. And let's see, let's go back over to putty. Let's screen in. So we'll do screen dash R FFmpeg. And we do see it is encoding. And just so you know what that striping is, the reason why the it's full of text is when it starts by default, it's smaller than the actual uh, status bar. And because of that, it starts wrapping around the screen so it doesn't overwrite itself correctly. So 
just just so you know that's why that happens but we do see it is working it is we do see frames outputting we see everything going across so let's go back over to the computer again let's see and i'm just going to restart this once more do control a and d on putty and let's just restart this go back over here and what we can actually do is just try pulling it up locally by stopping our service here just do OMX player and doing our address so UDP colon forward slash forward slash 239.1.1.1 colon 10,000 and let's see what it comes up with it said have a nice day that's very nice of it. So we'll go back over to Putty. Let's just run it again manually, just so we see it again. Because it is actually just calling the same, the same thing here. When we run this, still refusing. We may actually need to reboot it, let's say. Well, we saw it working a second ago. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do control A and D. Oh, we're in the local. I'm gonna LBU commit this and I'm gonna reboot it. And then I'm going to come over to this machine and reboot this just so everything restarts simultaneously hopefully without crashing the capture card and let's see what it does riveting riveting video right here so I do see the camera turned on let's see if it picks up the stream I'll restart the putty session And just so you know, I was having this issue as well, and I think part of it is because I'm using a multicast address. It's a little uh, unpredictable. Switch over here. So we do see it is running. but it doesn't want to display. So let's troubleshoot this. I'm gonna open up another uh, putty window here and see if I can switch to it.
Um, let's see. And you're not going to be able to see that. Let me quickly change this. Okay. And this is the... Um, actual display so I'm just gonna stop what's there I'm going to just do OMX player and let's see what debug options we have and see if there's any way we can get additional verbosity so if we do a dash I we can get with info and we can also get dash s for stats so let's try that so we'll try omx player which is the hardware player for actual um for the raspberry pi so it uses the older omx version we could also use ffmpeg for this as well but in this particular case i didn't want to do both the display and the actual encoder in the same video although we are doing it now so figure that one out so omx player dash capital I dash S UDP colon forward slash forward slash 239.1.1.1 colon 10,000. Does look like it's waiting for our GOP. Because it is using FFmpeg on the back end. It's detecting the stream, but it couldn't find the keyframe. So let's actually go back over to our other screen and pretty much I'm going to exit out of that. I'll clear this just so you don't have to look at it. Let's go into our settings here and let's change our settings to an integer for our actual uh, output format gop size output frame rate and let's just make this 24 and let's try restarting it All right, we do see it's running right now. We'll switch back over to our other buddy session. We can restart this. Interesting. So it's reading all of the frames and every and all the metadata correctly, but we're getting a PPS error, non-existing PPS. So it's saying it's not able to determine the frame size. So something we can do to actually try and troubleshoot this is let's just go into our executable file on our other window on our encoder.
And let's just get rid of the zero latency and the preset and see if that makes any difference. I do have this saved elsewhere, so I'm not worried about deleting it. And we'll restart this once again. And we'll switch back over to here. Actually, let's make sure before I do that. Okay, we do see it is running, so no errors induced. We'll go back over here. And it's not catching the start of the stream. This is an OMX player issue relating to how it's actually doing it because you see how it's actually giving some additional uh, flags that you could add to the FFmpeg to be able to do it. And part of it, it's saying you can't find parameters, no unspecified size. Let's see if there's a way that we can specify it manually. And this, the FIFO buffer is first in, first out. That's not actually the uh, the actual size. Even though it says size. Same thing with the uh, Q. We can try FPS. I'm curious if we actually have a better option. So I'm just gonna install FFmpeg really quick. And let's just see if we can actually get it to work through using that. So we'll do FFmpeg dash I, or uh, we'll do dash F, MPEG TS dash I, UDP colon forward slash forward slash 239.1.1.1 colon 10,000. Dash pix underscore FMT BGRA. And I believe it's frame buffer. I'm going to try and just do this for memory without looking it up. Let's see. So dash F, FB dev. I gotta remember what it is. Let me see if I have it in another thing. So pretty much what I'm gonna look at is see if there's an FFmpeg instance that I have that has something similar. And I do believe I have it. Okay, 
forward slash dev forward slash FB0. Now, I don't know if uh, it actually requires it to be a different format. Let's just give it a shot. Okay, so that did actually go through. But it's telling us we need to do 5651E, and actually I think I have that here as well. Let's try that. Whoops. All right. So I do actually think I know what the issue is. So the reason it was working during all of my testing and all of this is because I started the FFmpeg instance after I started the player. So let me actually stop it here on the encoder side. Restart this, come back over to this, do start, and now it's able to read it. So if we go back over to the computer, so we can see that it is in fact working. So that is very annoying. So that is very annoying. But short form is but that does look like it's related to like more so the player since it was so receiving player, data was receiving as expected. Data. It just wasn't able to decode it effectively. So I'll lower down this other volume so you don't hear an echo. So. So even without the zero latency and without the uh, preset, it does look like it is in fact uh, doing what we expect and with very low latency. Uh, those really only have an effect on the actual encoder itself, not with the actual uh, transport stream, which is usually the majority of the limitations associated with buffering and everything else like that. So, you know, that's pretty much it. I'm going to put all of this code up on GitHub. I will uh, just try and check through it just to see if there's a way I can make it a little bit more resilient. But as far as uh, just kind of coming covering the bases and giving an example and everything else like that, I do think that this definitely covers exactly what it demonstrates exactly what it's doing. So for a basic example, it's definitely fit to serve the point. And then, um, you know, you can obviously take it from there and we'll probably cover some more advanced and more resilient and more polished examples in the future. But thanks for watching the video today. If you liked the video, be sure to hit that like button and leave a comment down below. And if you have a friend who might enjoy this kind of content, be sure to share this video with them. I'm, you know, I, I, I would definitely appreciate it and I hope they would appreciate it too. And if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. Helps me out a lot. And then hit that notification bell. That way, you know, the next time we're getting extended. So until then, take care.